Uh, I love his preaching. He preaches hard. He's not a hard preacher, but he preaches hard. There's a difference. Pastor's heart. And I'm uh, blessed to have him with us tonight. If you would, Brother David Peacock. better be careful that Nashville don't pick her up and then if she, if they do pray that she gets laryngitis that was a joke thank you for the one person that got that a lot warmer when I left Florida this morning than it is now okay I'm doing great so far How about coming to 1 Kings chapter 19, and since we have a group up here, let me come down here and shake off some of the butterflies. I think sometimes in the Christian life, we set such a high expectation for what everybody thinks we should be like. In other words, oftentimes we let what other people think control who we are instead of just being who we are, and that in and of itself adds pressure to us to try to act like something that we're not or not capable of being at the time when pressure is on. One of my favorite preachers in all of the Bible is a man by the name of Elijah. And you might be surprised that I'm not impressed with him as a man as much for him calling down fire on Carmel as his willingness to get back up after failure. I don't know if you could imagine what it would be like to be the main guy, the main preacher, the main one that anybody in the nation of Israel would turn to. When his life began, he comes out of Tishbeer. And the Lord calls him out and tells him to deliver a, just a short message and he faithfully does so and basically says, and you all know the story, basically says to Ahab, it's not going to rain anymore, end of the sermon, no altar call, no big applause, nothing takes place. And then he goes off and hides by the brook Cherith. And the Lord said, now by the way, since it's not going to be raining, that means there's not going to be any food growing. And so you're going to have to depend on me to provide not just water for you because you've got to have water to survive, but you're going to have to provide, you have to depend on me to provide food for you. And so you know what happens. He goes by the brook Cherith. You all know the story very well. And he sits there for a period of over three years, about three and a half year period of time that he sits there and the brook babbles up and gives him water and the ravens come and bring him food from whatever the, you know, the places that they got the food from, enough to keep him alive. And for three and a half years, it's him and God alone in the wilderness. Now, I don't know about you and I don't have to have a whole lot of human contact, but just being alone, you might think for yourself, well, that wouldn't be too bad if it was me and God. Well, yeah, but God has other things to do than just you. You're not the only thing on God's mind tonight. Sometimes we forget that. We kind of think that whatever's going on in our life is the only thing that matters to God, but the fact of the matter is he has a lot more things going on than just us. Three and a half year period of time that the Bible doesn't say anything at all about what's going on except the brook is babbling and the food's coming and apparently he's sleeping out there in the bushes and everything is okay and fine because you don't know anything until one day the brook dries up. And all of a sudden the revival has stopped and everybody is upset now and that's as good a place as any to quit. Because most of us will generally stay with it as long as it's going the way we want it to go. And generally speaking, we do okay until the Lord throws us a curveball and then all of a sudden the brook dries up. It's like, Lord, wait a minute. I'm out here doing what you want me to do, the way you want me to do it. I delivered the message you told me to deliver. I'm obviously a prophet. It's not raining. There's a famine in the land. The people are starving. The animals are starving. And their tongues are cleaving to their jaws. But boy, you're taking care of me. Boy, this sure is wonderful this sure is great boy the church is really going good it's wonderful and the brook dried up 
And oftentimes in our life, when things don't continue to go the way we think they should go, we find our little space to say, you know something, I've had enough. Somebody parked in my parking space, or somebody sat in my pew, or somebody taught my Sunday school class, or somebody sang my special, somebody picked up my guitar. Now, maybe y'all aren't like that up here, but in the South, trust me when I tell you, they can find a bone to pick over just about anything. I mean, you can be going over there and one minute you'll be complaining because the grass isn't cut. The next minute you're complaining because they blowed grass on your car while it was parked in the parking lot. I mean, I've seen them complain over the color of the walls that they paint or the color of the carpet that they put down. I bought some argue one time over whether or not to spend $300 to buy a new lawnmower or to spend 10 bucks to fix the old one. That goes way, way back a lot of years ago. But I've watched them argue. In other words, what I'm saying to you is, is sometimes in life the brook dries up even when you're in the perfect will of God. Matthew chapter 14, the apostles are in the perfect will of God. They're in the boat that God told them to be in, going where God told them to go. And the next thing you know, there's a storm raging in their life. And they're sitting there saying, Lord, I don't understand. We're doing exactly what you told us to do. Can I just sort of cut to the chase because I got somewhere I want to go tonight, believe it or not. But here's what you have to understand. Being in the will of God does not make you immune to trouble. Being in the will of God doesn't mean your brook will not dry up. Being in the will of God does not guarantee, as a matter of fact, it almost ensures that you're going to have more trouble than other people are going to have. And if we as Christian people would learn to understand that, that one of the greatest things God gives us is the truthfulness and the honesty of telling us, according to the Bible, that if you're going to reign with me, there's going to be suffer, and that in this suffering and in this world, you're going to have tribulation. People are so whacked out about that that they think when he says, in this world you'll have tribulation, they think you're going through the tribulation. Well, they can stay here and stick with it if they want to. I'm going out in the rapture before the tribulation. But it doesn't mean you won't have tribulation. In other words, here you have a great man of God and his brook dried up. I don't know if you can grasp a hold of what I'm trying to say to you tonight is, is but oftentimes as Christians, we kind of get led down this primrose path that now that I'm saved, everything's going to be wonderful. Well, it ain't always going to be wonderful. Just from your own request for prayer, you obviously have had problems and troubles and trials and difficulties in your life. As a matter of fact, Jesus Christ, pretty much perfect if my Bible studies are correct. I'm not a Bible theologian. I know a little bit about it. But it looked to me like he was without sin, and yet he had trouble. He was without sin, tempted in all points, yet without sin, and yet he had enemies. And then he winds up getting greeted with three nails and a cross. And he winds up going to to Calvary for you and I. And so he sets up our beginning by his suffering and his death in the ending. His brook dried up. My question first of all would be for you tonight. Is there any better way to have your faith tested than when your brook dries up? When God does something in your life that you don't understand, that makes absolutely no sense, that you have no ability to work it out. Now, for most of us as men, now you ladies may not be this way, but for most of us as men, we kind of want to try to fix things. And we'll tend, in order, instead of reading the instructions, we'll tend to go ahead and try to fix it ourselves when you're sitting there going, honey, if you just read the instructions, you wouldn't have to, you know, shut up, leave me alone, I know how to do this. And then when she's not looking, you go back and read the instructions again. And and then you're like, she was right. You know, how do you know? Well, you got all these parts left over. And then you wonder why it doesn't work. And then she comes over and you go, you forgot the Duma Flitchie and the thingamabob. And it's supposed to go in here and that with the main Ferengator rod. And and that's where those things are supposed to be. But, But here's the thing. When God puts you in a situation... After you're doing everything you know to do, you're out here on a cold night, 30 degrees or whatever, and snowing outside, and a small group of people are gathered here, and you would think to yourself, well, why doesn't God reward us for this? I mean, I'm living right, I'm doing right, and your testimony is is you have all kind of problems and difficulties in your life. Well, what kind of God is that? You certainly have never questioned that, have you, in your life? Certainly you've never wondered why the baby died? You never wondered why the spouse died. You never wondered why the kids went prodigal. 
Can you answer me a question, please? Maybe you can tell me. I've asked this question a number of times. Can you tell me how in the story of the prodigal son, when the Lord's talking there to the Pharisees and he's using the, the Pharisees there and the, the story's really more about the elder brother than anything, can you show me one place where that prodigal's father did anything wrong? You can read that passage a hundred times. You know what you'll never find? You'll never find any good reason at all for that prodigal to leave the house. I bet you in a crowd this size, I bet you some of your kids have gone prodigal. I bet you some of your grandkids and great-grandkids have gone prodigal. How do you explain that in a preacher's family? How do you explain that in a missionary's family? How do you explain that in somebody's family that has uh, deserted all the things in the sinful world and have tried to live for God and tried to witness for God and try to go to church and try to read their Bible and pray and study and fast and you know, go to Bible school and all that kind of stuff and their kids go prodigal? How do you explain that stuff? There's no guarantees in the spiritual life other than it appears that if the Lord really does love you, He's going to give you the benefit of suffering for Him, whether you like it or not. Man is born under trouble as the sparks fly upward, right? Are you with me so far? This is just a setup. This is just the vestibule. I'm just trying to, to say this is where we live and this is the kind of thing that Christians have a misconception about. The idea is, is that now that I'm saved, my problems are over. In eternity they are, but God's going to put you through some things that you can't explain with an explaining machine. You can rightly divide your Bible. You can know everything from get up to get gone in the Bible. You can know where everything fits exactly as it's supposed to fit. You can be gun barrel straight, and then the Lord will allow something in your life, and you're thinking, now, Lord, wait a minute. Why are you doing this? The first thing that most Christians will do to you is, is they'll say to you, well, there must be sin in your life. God's punishing you. Well, that's Joe's miserable comforters. And on a cold night like this, you need more than a miserable comforter. Okay, well, that was another joke. But, <laughs> but, but, but listen to me. Job's friends thought it was Job's fault that Job was in the trouble. And so oftentimes what happens is the devil says, well, the Lord's chastening you. Well, look, if we're honest, we all know that we could be chastened for something in our life. We do our best to keep our sins confessed. But if we were to be in trouble all the time, then guess what? We'd either be sick or somebody be in trouble all the time if God was chasing us for everything. Sometimes he does it for his glory. Sometimes he does it to teach us things. Sometimes he simply does do it because of chastening, but not chastening as often as we make it to be. Sometimes it's those things that make us check up on our own faith to find out where we really are with God and whether or not we really do trust him when he does something bigger than we understand here in the story of Elijah going back to where we are there you have Elijah there and the first thing he does is he would do any good Baptist preacher he say well you got to have a meal before you can preach so I'll tell you what you do there's a woman over there and she's got uh, uh, some uh, a biscuit there some biscuit flour and stuff like that that's the trilateral root word there. I know it says br bread, but that's really, you have to study the Hebrew meaning of the word. That's biscuits, <laughs> at least in the south. <laughs> and don't quote me on that. But at any rate, you, you look at that and he says, I'll tell you what I want you to do. Go ask that woman for her last biscuit. Now, I want you to pause and think for a minute. I mean, no matter how what an ogre you might think Elijah would be, can you imagine how hard that would be for a man that's been provided for for all this time, for three and a half years, and he walks into town and he's never met this old woman a day in his life, and she's out there picking up sticks and stuff, and he says, hey, sister, how you doing? And she says, oh, I'm doing all right. How are you doing? She said, fine. She said, well, I'm a preacher. She says, yeah, I can tell. You look like you've been well-fed when the rest of us are starving. Belt looks like a fence around a chicken graveyard, but at any rate, <laughs> he says, uh, he says, uh, well, he said, I was wondering, uh, what are you doing? They said, well, I'm, I'm making up, uh, gonna get me some sticks for a fire here, and and uh, then I'm gonna make up my last biscuit for my boy and I, and then we're gonna die. And he said, oh, you're gonna have a biscuit, are you? She said, yeah, I'm gonna make up a biscuit. She said, well, how about this? How about give me your biscuit? Now, all joking aside, man. How hard do you think it was for Elijah to ask that woman for her last biscuit when knowing her and her boy, that's the last meal they're going to have and his been being fed? Don't you think, can't you give him a little bit of credit that he probably had a hard time getting that one out? That's one of those messages, gentlemen, that you know God wants you to preach. You don't want to preach. That's a tough message. The message of asking a lady for her last biscuit. I admire the faith of the lady. It doesn't say anywhere in there that she argued with him. Right? Y'all don't know it yet, I'm not. I'm already preaching. I know I hadn't started the general way. You know, here's your text, and here's your three points, and here's your poem, and now we're out of here. We're not even there yet. I'll get to that in a couple of hours. 
But, here, but here's what you got to understand. God's brought him along that way, and I admire the faith of that lady. She said, okay, I'll give you the biscuit. That's a pretty major deal. So she makes a biscuit and gives him a cruise of water there that's by his head there, and he eats the biscuit, and you know what happens. The flour doesn't run out. And now the show begins. Now the Lord calls him out there, and he says to him, Elijah, I'm leading up to the passage here. Now I need you to go tell Ahab that you want to talk to him, and we want to have a showdown at the OK Corral. And he said, where's it going to be? He said, it'd be high noon up there on the mountaintop. That's when their God is supposedly the most powerful, the one that skips across the clouds up there and makes it thunder and makes it rain. He's the God, and his wife's the God of fertility and that kind of a deal. So I'll tell you what, let's do. Let's go up here and have a big showdown. So he goes over there, and you know what Ahab says? Are you the one trouble in Israel? It's funny when people are under pressure how they blame you for their trouble. And you know what Ahab says? He says, you're the one trouble. He said, no, I ain't the one trouble in Israel, but I tell you what we can do. Let's have a showdown. You know the story better than I do. They go up there and they get the altar all built up and they, they jump on the altar and cut themselves and they scream and holler and rant and rave and have a rock and roll show and all that other kind of a deal and they have smoke coming out of the platform and have all the instruments up there playing and nothing happens and nothing happens and Elijah's over there mocking them and laughing and making fun of them and that kind of a deal and then it's his turn and he gets up there and you know what happens? He puts the water on the altar and the fire falls and boy they have a hallelujah shouting good time. He kills 400 50 prophets of Baal, maybe the other 400 too, so 850 prophets of Baal and after that it's on that waters running through the river down through there and it's all full of blood and everything now and then he sees out there in the distance a cloud the size of a man's hand and he tells his servant he said, tell the Ahab the king he said, he better hightail it to town it's fixing to come a frog strangler and boy the rain comes I mean, gentlemen, you talk about preaching a message in the fire fall, and I mean, my goodness, man. It, not only the fire comes, but boy, the rain is coming down in bucketfuls, and the animals have got their faces turned up, and they're drinking water, and the water begins to splash up on the walls and stuff like that, and down that rain and stuff comes, man, I mean, I'm telling you. And Elijah says, well, man, ain't anybody going to take me home. He just preached a great message, and rain fell. They've been wanting rain three and a half years. Listen, Christian, and not a single person said thank you. Not one person said I appreciate it. Not one person said, hey, preacher, uh, sure am glad you were around. Appreciate you helping us out. Not one, not a single person. He comes up there at the top of the mountain there, and the Lord says, how are you going to get back to town? And Elijah says, well, uh, I don't know. I guess I have to walk back. Nobody's going to give me a ride. And he said, well, uh, why don't you check your legs out there? And he kind of squats and moves a little bit. And he said, I don't know, I'm getting kind of old laying there by the brook. I'm getting sort of stove up and arthritis is getting me and all that. He said, well, why don't you run a couple of sprints? Sprints, man, I'll break my full neck, Lord. I can't run sprints. I'm getting old. He said, well, try it. And the next thing you know, he looks like a road runner. And he takes off running out there, boy. And here's Jehu probably driving the chariot wildly. And Ahab's in that chariot going, man, what's that coming up here? And Elijah runs up there. I got a vivid imagination. And waves at him as he passes by him. And into the town he goes, man. I mean, he goes booking by him. I mean, to beat the band. And then he gets in there in the town, and I mean the rain is coming down, I mean to beat the band, and they've just got water dripping off of his hair and coming down his beard, and he's leaning up there against the wall trying to catch his breath and let his lungs catch up with his legs there, and he's sitting there breathing and stuff, and he's thinking, boy, it's going to be something. And in come all the town people, and not a soul even asked him to come in the house out of the rain. And then in comes the king and his chariots. And they don't even ask him to come in out of the rain. Don't offer him a biscuit. Don't offer him nothing. Did you hear what I said? He's the one that was preaching when the fire fell and the miracle came and the water fell and the nation of Israel said they were going to follow God. He was the one that brought the mail. And nobody appreciated squat. Now, I don't know if you've ever been there as a Christian. Surely you wouldn't start a revival meeting off there. But you know one of the things that plagues Christians more than anything, they do things, quote, for the Lord, but if people don't tell them thank you for it, you know how quick they are to, bake, to, to take off and leave? I made that tater salad. You know, I've been making that for years. Ain't nobody ever said thank you a lot one time. Give me back a busted dish. That's the South. I don't know how they are up here. Up here it might be key lime pie or spaghetti for all I know. I don't know what it is. 
you know, I don't know how come them people can't show up here to work and everything, you know. They just show up here the last minute when there comes come time to take the pictures and them kinds of things like that. I'm the one set up all the stuff out there for the fellowship and all that kind of, I planned everything like it's supposed to be and that's the South. That's how they talk in the South. I grew up in the South. I grew up in the mountains in Tennessee. And you know what I understand? I understand exactly how Elijah felt. Now let's pick it up in verse chapter number 19. We got from here to Revelation 22 to go tonight, so we got a long way to go. Look in 1 Kings chapter number 19, and then we're going to pray and have a little bit of preaching time. The Bible said Ahab told uh, Jezebel all Elijah had done with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. And Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. He saw that and he arose and he went for his life. Now watch how this is twisted here. He rose and he went for his life. He came to Beersheba, belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. He himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under the juniper tree and he requested for himself that he might die. What? One minute he's running for his life and the next minute he's sitting under a juniper tree saying, I want to die. He's suicidal. You know what he says? He says, it's enough, Lord. Let me die. Now, how in the world do you come after being taken care of by a babbling brook, seeing God do a miracle for that woman and her son over there after taking their last biscuit, being bold enough to preach the message to the king again, and then go up there on Carmel and be able to see God do one of the greatest miracles in the entire Bible and then supply Israel's needs as far as rain and water is concerned? How is it within such a short period of time that same man who had all those victories, you find him sitting there under a juniper tree saying let me die I'm suicidal you say I don't believe anybody that's a Christian would commit suicide you ain't lived long enough then you hadn't had God put something on you you don't understand you haven't seen a little one die you haven't seen drug addicted kids you haven't had pain and agony and difficulty I remember getting a call one time I remember walking in that house off of San Jose Boulevard and there's an old woman sitting over there on the couch I can see it plain as yesterday she's got a little walking cane right there beside her her carpet's just as white as a sheet of paper up there and she's sitting on a white couch and got a little drug, uh, uh, afghan over the thing little hand knitted afghan over the thing and she's sitting there just shaking and tears just dripping off the end of her cheek right there. Blue lights flashing out there in front. And the fire, fire engine out there. Red and white lights flashing out there. I remember walking in there. I was a lieutenant at the time. And I walked over there and I said, well, ma'am, are you okay? I, I, I'm sorry for your loss. And they said, come back here, Lou. And I said, what's going on? I went back there in the bathroom in the shower. And here's a man who's gone back there. And thank the Lord he turned off his oxygen tank, took a 12-gauge shotgun and put it in his mouth. And you can figure out the rest of the story. And did it in the shower. Left her one of the sweetest notes I've ever, ever read in all my life. Saved man by her testimony. So I don't believe he can be saved and do that. Well, just hang on just a minute before you get too carried away. Terminal cancer and dying and pain and taking all the money that they had to try to take care of her and try to make sure she was going to be okay. Left her a whole page note there of some things, some of the sweetest things, romantic things you've ever read in all your life. The bottom line of the whole thing was the pain and the agony and the drain materially on him and financially, monetarily was gone. And he just said, honey, you're better off without me. Now, you may not think so, but you say, well, what do you think about that? I don't think anything about that. I look at that and say to myself, I don't know that I might not do the same thing if I was in the same situation. You say, oh, you know, you surely you wouldn't do that. You're a preacher. You're a Christian. You wouldn't do that. Elijah did. Yeah. Moses did. Job did. Yeah. Paul said, I've had enough. I'm in a strait betwixt two. I have a desire to depart, which for me is far better for me to live as Christ, but to die is gain. Paul's constantly thinking about, I'm ready to check out. If I know my statistics, and I know them pretty well, in a crowd this size, some of you have either had that thought or are having it right now. It's Thanksgiving time, it's Christmas time, and everybody's not coming home, and the prodigals ain't coming to the house, and some of them are locked away in prison, and some of them are in the hospital, and some of them are dying, and some of them have terminal diseases, and some marriages are on the rocks, and some kids are, are doing things that you never even dreamed possible to be done, and you're blaming yourself, and I should have done that, and I shouldn't have done this, and maybe if I'd have done that different, if I'd have done this different, and the stuff plagues you, and you come to a point in your life where even as a Christian sitting 
sitting in church with a Bible in your lap after singing up here said, it is enough, Lord, let me die. I know I'm going to heaven. I'm out of here. I've had enough. Elijah comes to that thing. He gets that letter from the lady. I've heard preachers preach this thing because they're so bitter toward women, you know. He's running from a woman. He ain't running from a woman. He's running from disappointment. He's running from discouragement. He's running because he'd expected the people to do what they said. They said, listen, if God's God, we'll serve God. And if Baal's God, we'll serve Baal. But whichever one wins the contest, well, God won the contest and they lied like being the pastor of a church. Oh yeah, preacher will be there. Come rain, sleet, snow, or well, rain or sleet, well, as long as it's sunshine and we'll be there. <laughs> Nobody offered that preacher any gratitude whatsoever and the next thing you know, what does he get as an appreciation? You know what he got as an offering? He got a letter from the queen that said, I'm going to kill you. And he said, I'll be jumped. He got his little feet together and put his little sandals on and off he started going, boy, and I mean the weight got heavy. And He started out in the middle of the morning probably and it hadn't quite got hot yet. He come right to the edge of the desert, the little area there that was marked off and he looked at his servant who couldn't have been worth anything, kind of like a Gehazi guy. That servant shouldn't have left him alone. But you know what he said to him? He said, you can go ahead and go where I'm going. You don't need to go. And the servant said, good man, goodbye, good riddance, see you later. And that servant turned around and left him. And that's a whole nother sermon in and of itself. But the bottom line is, is that off he goes into that desert. Look at him walking out there. Here's a great man of God that just called down fire from heaven and it has been ringing, I mean frog strangling, I mean pouring down like boulders coming out of sky. I mean, you talk about hooked up with God, that guy's hooked up with God. You know what makes me shake about that passage? Is that if God allowed that to happen to that man, I can't have to touch a, a hem of that guy's garment. And if it happened to him, what makes me think it couldn't happen to me? I've been depressed over far less. I've had people tell me they'd be there and never show up. I've had people make promises and didn't do it. I've had failures in my life. Maybe you haven't, but I've had failures in my life I didn't think I'd recover from. You say, what are they? They're under the blood. And you don't remember them, and I ain't going to tell you about them because you will forget them. But lo and behold, there he goes out in the wilderness, and by now it's hot. I mean, that sun is coming down on him to beat the band, man. And now he's out there in that sun, and that sun just keeps on taunting him and taunting him and beating down on him. That old bald head is turning redder and redder, and he doesn't have any water, and he's getting dehydrated, and he's half out of his mind. And the next thing you know, boy, he's thinking, boy, I sure wish I had that babbling brook right now, but it ain't there no more. Well, I sure do wish I had that cruise of water that woman left me by the by my head there well it ain't there no more boy that biscuit boy I sure wouldn't want that thing now boy it'd be all dried out and boy he's kicking up sand and it's getting between his toes now and now the tops of his feet are getting blistered and he's getting out there boy in that hot and there ain't a breath of wind blowing at all and he's going boy you're just miserable good for nothing rotten I mean I'm no better than my father's and the devil's right on his back saying you're right you are you ever read 1 Peter chapter number 5 and verse number 7? Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. You know what verse you know? You know verse 8. The devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Verse 7 says, you better put your cares on Jesus. You say, why? Because the devil's going to jump on you. And if you're carrying your cares, when he jumps on you, it's going to bury you. And instead of Elijah taking his cares to the Lord, you know what happened? He's trying to bear him himself. And he's weighted down by him. He's a failure. He's no good. Because we all know, preachers, we all know, Christian, success is determined by numbers, right? Jesus must have been a flop. He only had 12. One of them was a devil. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I don't know how many devils we got in here, but at any rate... <laughs> And here he goes out there. Now he's dehydrated. You know what happens when people get dehydrated? Surely you know. They get crazy. Did you ever know that? When people get dehydrated, when they need water, you know what happens to them? They think out of their mind. They get to a point where I've seen Christians get. 
it's been so long since you had a good drink of water. You've been out in the desert for a long time. You know what happens? You get mean-spirited to people. You get touchy. You get irritable. You get acting crazy. You say stupid things. You do things you wouldn't normally do. You say, why? Because you're thirsty. Because you need to be able to get a drink. Well, Elijah's half out of his mind now. You know why? He thinks he's a complete failure. Off in the distance there, by now the sun has just about taken the complete toll on him. He looks off there in the distance. He sees a juniper tree out there. And that sun beginning to set down off there in the horizon. And it begin, goes from bright, bright yellow and golden color. And then it begins to dip on down there. A little bit of oranges and come in and some pinks and some pale colors begin. And then all of a sudden that thing is just as red as a beet, boys. It begins to drop down on the horizon. And the temperature begins to drop really quick. And all of a sudden that old dehydrated old cuss, that old preacher he sees that juniper tree he sees those boughs underneath that juniper tree he said well that's as good a place as any to make a graveyard and he crawls down underneath that juniper tree and he pulls his knees up to him and gets in that fetal position and he's so dehydrated his tears won't even run down his cheeks anymore and he whimpers like a little baby that great man of God who had his hopes dashed and his dreams dashed because he hasn't been able to turn Israel around and it's all his fault and now he's bearing all the burden for everything. Oh, did I mention to you, he's alone again all by himself, only this time there's no babbling brook and there's no ravens and there's no servant and there's nobody there that cares. boy all of a sudden that little breeze begins to blow through the boughs of that thing it sounds like angels playing on violins blowing through those boughs of that juniper tree and it begins to sing like a lullaby coming through there and he begins to shake and tremble because of having being dehydrated the way he was and he passes off to sleep as he's listening to the hyenas laughing and the bears growling and the lions roaring and they're all going to fight over who's going to get a bite out of that old preacher Sounds like some of us tonight, doesn't it? Aren't some of you sitting here tonight thinking, boy, if I don't get a drink of water here pretty quick, I'm going to be done, I'm going to be through, I'm going to be out, I've had enough, I can't take it anymore. I go to church three and four times a week. I go to revival meetings, I listen to tapes, I read my Bible, I pray, I study. I'm just as dry as stinking cracker juice. The sun has beaten me up, the world's beaten me up, the, my job's beaten me up, my family's beaten me up, my addictions are beating me up. I can't catch a break anywhere I turn. It's just one trouble after another. I've just had enough and where's God and all this? I'm all by myself, I got no brook. You say, what are you talking about? I'm talking about even Christians getting in the throes of depression. Now I'm going to touch something here real carefully and then I'm going to move on. I'm not a physician and I'm not a psychiatrist. But I'm going to tell you, if you don't believe that depression is real for Christians, you're smoking crack. Because Christians can get depressed just like anybody else can get depressed. And just because you're saved, it doesn't relieve you from being depressed. And if you're depressed, sometimes you need some help to be able to overcome that depression. And I'll leave that between you and your physician. But I'm telling you this, it is high time that the church recognize that just because you're saved, it doesn't make you immune to discouragement and depression. It's a real thing. Amen. Well, he goes to sleep figuring he'll never wake up on this side of glory. He figures he'll die before sunrise. The lights go out and it's so dark you can't even see your hand in front of you and then the chandeliers of glory begin to pop out as they'll do in the desert. And that moon begins to pop out over there and dance across those sun-baked uh, uh, sand dunes out there and it begins to reflect back off of that thing, an unusual sort of a sheen there as that moonlight dances across the sand there and off in the distance there's an image of somebody walking directly at him. And the hyenas have quit laughing now and the lions quit roaring and all of a sudden here comes the angel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when he thought everybody else was gone and nobody else cared and he's laying there whimpered in the fetal position in my mind's eye I see the Lord taking his own cloak off just like the good Samaritan did over there when he put the boy on his donkey covers him up like a woman would cover up a newborn baby in a 
crib. Maybe Pat's that old wiry white hair, the little bit of tufts of it out of his face. He said, I ain't done with you yet. Amen. Yes. Goes over and builds a fire. You say, why? The boy's cold and he needs some light. And puts on the fire some biscuits. Amen. The comforter's on his feet. That's it. Amen. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, there's a cruise of water. You say, why? Yes. Oh, did I forget to tell you? He's thirsty. Did I forget to tell you that he was out of his mind because he needed a drink? You see, you never see that showing up when the babbling brook was there and he had a drink every day. But he hadn't had one in a long time. And all of a sudden, the morning begins to crack. It's just dawn. Whippoorwills are beginning to go out. You begin to hear the crickets begin to calm down, and it gets that quiet, sort of an eerie time just before the deer move early in the morning. And he hears the fire popping. And he looks over there, and he smells the biscuit bacon. He leans over there to his side, and there's a cruise of water in a crystal vase. And he looks across the fire there, and he said, Well, I must be in heaven. You're here, and biscuits are here, so I must be in heaven. <laughs> that might have been a little carnal, but at any rate. <laughs> and instead of the Lord kicking him for failure, chastising him for his discouragement and his depression, his disappointment. The Lord says to him, are you thirsty? He said, how do you know? It's implied in the passage. Why else would he give him a cruise of water if he didn't know what he needed? Right. You know what God knew he needed? He knew he needed a drink of water. Amen. I'm reminded of the story of that little old woman by the well. Do you remember that woman? Remember the woman over there in John chapter 4? The woman at the well. Have you ever studied the Bible enough to know why that woman came out in the noonday sun? That's the time that only those people came out. The time you went out in the heat of the day was the time nobody except the misfits, the malcontent, the people that were the, the ones in society nobody wanted to be around. Well, except at nighttime when nobody else could see them. Down she comes. If I could paint, oh, I wish I could paint. I'd paint that woman as she coming down the road there. I'd have Jesus leaning up against the well. I'm coming back to Elijah in a minute. I'm not done with him yet. I'd have him leaning up against the well, waiting. You know, he said he had needs to go by that way. Yeah. The boys are in town getting some food and stuff like that, and I'd paint that woman coming down the road there, and Jesus kind of grinned. Sees her coming. You could see her from a mile off. She'd probably have a mohawk. Be lime green if I could paint. She'd look like she lost a fight with a nail gun, man. She'd have piercings all over her from one end to the other. Been in a paint booth while she's been painting a car. She'd have tattoos all over from stem to stern of everything you could possibly imagine. She wouldn't have on enough clothes to make a pair of britches for a blue jay. I mean, that's how you paint centers, isn't it? That's how you paint the people that can come to Jesus when, you know, good folk don't come, right? I'd have her coming down there, and I'd have her in her mind's eye. I'd have a little bubble up here. What do you think that woman's thinking? Every man in her life has always abused her. You say, what about all them husbands she had? They weren't hers. They were somebody else's husband. You need to read the passage. That woman had just been passed around and used. Do you know why? She needed a drink. The Lord said, you give me a drink of water, I'll give you one where you never thirst again. You know what I think that woman's problem was? I think the reason she kept being in all the trouble she was in, she was looking for that real drink. She needed somebody to meet her needs, and she had never found it in all the men she had been with. But maybe you're just not quite that thirsty where you'd be willing to come in the middle of the day when only the bad people came. 
Maybe you're not quite thirsty enough yet. Let's change the channel and go back to Elijah. Great prophet, great man of God, great preacher. Fix him to die. It's enough, Lord, let me die. You down here to kill me? That's probably what he thought. No, I'm not here to kill you. I'm not here to ridicule you. I ain't here to get on to you. I'm here to give you what you need. Here's you some water. Amen. And here's you a biscuit. Yeah. He looks down and he said, man, where'd this robe come from? He said, that was my robe. You can have it. You can have it. I got plenty on up there. There's a closet up there that's for prodigal's robes, and I'll just take that out of there and give you a robe. He said, that's a pretty nice robe. I never had a robe quite like that before. Is you going to bury me in this? No. You fixing to get on to me? You see, when you get like this, you know what happens? You get so touchy that when you come to church, all you think the Lord's going to do is knock the tar out of you. And so you come to church and you're sitting there thinking, oh, yeah, yeah, somebody's going to say something. And they do. They ever, evidently they do. The devil's imps always show up there. And then the preacher gets up and he can say, for God so loved the world. See, there you go. He's, he's aiming at me again. Because you get that way. You get touchy. You get overly sensitive. And boy, he sits there and he looks like a puppy that has had his head buried in a bag of puppy chow. I mean, that old belly has swole up out there from eating biscuits and drinking that water, man. I mean, to a fairly well. I forgot to tell you, under the tablecloth there, there was some maple syrup and some butter, too. But, but at any rate, he, he, is, he is swole up, boy. I mean, swole up. Like after Thanksgiving, you know, too much tryptophan and you're sitting there fighting off the turkey and dressing in the cranberry sauce and the pumpkin pie and all that kind of stuff. And you're already thinking leftovers, but you, you wouldn't even know where to put them. You're so full. And you figure, oh, if I'd get a nap, I'd feel better. And he yawns. And the Lord says, you sleepy? You know why? You need some rest. You're tired. You're a human being. You've been through a lot. You just killed 450 men. You've been serving me for three and a half years on the backside of the desert with no crowd, nobody around you, no people even knew you were even around. Nobody even knew you were the man of God. You've been on the backside of the desert. Nobody even knew it was just me and you out here. You could tell them about it. They wouldn't believe it. It's like making a hole in one on Sunday. You can't tell nobody. <laughs> he said, well, I am kind of getting sleepy, but I... Uh, Worried about them animals getting me now. He said, well, don't worry about it. I'll stand guard. He begins to drift off to sleep, pulls that robe up around him, curls up next to that fire, and he begins to go to sleep. And then the next thing you know, he wakes up, and the Lord says, are you hungry? Are you thirsty? Do you need a robe for your journey? Do you need some rest? You say, well, preacher, what are you trying to tell me? Well, the message is actually really short. Because some of you are right there with Elijah under the juniper tree right now. And some of you, you know what you're saying? I've about had all I can take. And I love the Lord, and I believe the book, but I'm just going through the motions. And it's been such a long time since I had a drink of water. I feel like I'm going to just die. And that'd be just fine with me. But you know what happens with Elijah. He gets up. It lasts for about 15 minutes. He had a typical revival meeting. I got right. I went to the altar. Everything's good. It ain't 15 minutes later. He's got a mantle over his face and he's hiding in a cave. Oh, boy, you've gone from bad to worse now, boy. Now, listen close. I'm almost done. He goes off in that cave because you know what happens, men? When you get like this, you know what you want to do? You want to be all by yourself and be reclusive. You withdraw from everything. Ma'am, you do the same thing. Who are you going to turn to? You can't tell somebody you're actually depressed. You're a Christian. I don't know, they might think you're human. <laughs> yeah. But the next thing you know, you know what you want to do? You want to withdraw. And you know what happens in the story. The tornado comes and the fire comes and the earthquake comes and Elijah goes out and he's looking for him and all those things. 
And the Lord said, ain't you learned nothing yet, boy? Didn't you learn anything by the fire? I didn't speak to you from heaven about the fire. I didn't fall down on the altar like I did on Mount Carmel. I came down and sat right down there beside you and met your needs. Haven't you learned that I'm going to have to be close enough to you to speak to you in a still, small voice? Well, what does that mean, preacher? Well, what that means, ladies and gentlemen, is, is that in order for you to have him speak to you in a still, small voice, you've got to be in perfect fellowship with him. What was Elijah's problem? Well, he was a great prophet and everything until all of a sudden the one thing that happened in his life he let slip and didn't even see it go was his fellowship with Jesus Christ. His fellowship with God in the Old Testament had slipped because he had gotten so busy and then he got so consumed in his own personal situation that he forgot the one that had got him through everything was still right there with him. Well, after the Lord speaks to him there, he never drops the ball again. I wish I could only say I had one or two things against me like that. But i got to be honest with you, I found myself right there under Juniper Junction before. If you crawl up under there tonight, you know what you'll see? You'll see my initials DLP right there in that tree mark. It's enough, Lord. Just let me die. It's enough, Lord. I'm no good at this anyway. Where's the results? Where's the people? If I'm doing right, why are the grandkids doing this? And why are the kids doing that? And why is the church doing this? And why are the friends doing that? And Lord, if it's really you, then why you got problems here and problems there and problems here and problems there? And not before long, you know what can happen? You forget all about your fellowship with the one that's been taking care of you by the brook the whole time. And you think it's all about where you are right now. I want you to pause for a second and think. Whatever you're going through right now, you have a history of months or years where God's been feeding you by the Babylon Brook and taking care of you until all of a sudden you happen to be right here. But this is not your whole life. The juniper tree wasn't Elijah's whole life. Amen. Let's fast forward and I'll come to the end of the story. You know how it happens. Elisha goes over there and follows Elijah across the Jordan. The fiery chariot comes down. I wonder if we pulled the table up tonight and had him sitting right here, a little candle flickering right here, and the shadows dancing off the walls, and Elijah sitting across there, that old cuss is sitting there, that old bald head, white headed sitting there, looking there, stroking his beard probably, and I say, hey, old preacher, I asked you a couple of questions. Yeah, tell me what it was the most impressive time, the greatest time in your life. Was it when you were up there on Carmel? <laughs> no, it wasn't. That. Oh, I bet it was when he came down and got you in that fiery chair. I bet it's when you did those miracles. I bet that time you did, he said, no, no, you're wrong. The greatest time in my life was under the juniper tree when I was at my worst moment. He showed up. And he did things for me under the juniper tree that kept me running the rest of the time because I realized he wasn't just a fair weather friend. And in spite of me being the one that made the mistake, he still was the one that gave me light, gave me warmth, gave me fellowship, gave me a robe, gave me food, gave me water, gave me protection. I forgot all those things because it became too much about me. Preacher, why in a revival meeting would you deal with such a depressing subject? Because life is getting more and more depressing the longer we live. Yeah. And the pressure to act like you're not depressed when you are, it's a facade. It makes you almost like a hypocrite. Because you're trying to make it like, how are you? Fine. Or you just got gas, one or the other, you know. <laughs> how are you? I'm fine. I'm fine. <laughs> how you doing? Fine. I think that should be on every Christian's tombstone. How are you doing? I'm dead, but I'm fine. <laughs> I'm fine. Some of you are not fine. Some of you know what you need to do tonight. I'm going to turn it over to your pastor here in just a second. You know what you need to do tonight? You need to consider. You know something, Lord? I think maybe I should crawl underneath that juniper tree because I sure would like to talk to you for a little while. And I need you to baby me a little bit. Yeah. And my heart's broken. And I'm hurting. I'm hurting over... 
lost family member. I'm hurting over a busted marriage. I'm hurting over busted kids. I'm hurting over prodigals. I'm hurting over physical problems and bad diagnosis and bad prognosis. And, I'm, and God, I'm, I got to be honest with you, I can't take it anymore. I need some help, Lord. I, I know I'm supposed to be the bulwark of strength and I'm supposed to be all that in a bag of chips, but Lord, I'm telling you, I feel like I'm going to bust like an egg under a giant's heel. I'm, I'm coming apart, Lord. I'm coming apart at the seams. I need help. I need help. Oh, Lord, I may not be addicted to drugs. I may not be addicted to drinking. I'm addicted to something else like that. But you know what, Lord? I got problems just the same. And they're just as heavy on me as they are any drug addict or drunk that there is in the world out here. But the problem is, is we get to the point where we're too big to ask and too proud to admit that we're feeble and frail as dust. God says, I'll tell you what, if you get to that point, I can do something for you. Oh, I think that old preacher would say this tonight. Best time of my life was the worst time of my life. Everybody would look at it and say, man, what a failure. And the Lord said, no, that's when you got to find out things about me you would have never known without it. Maybe tonight you might consider the beginning of a few days of a revival meeting Maybe a good thing for you tonight to do is to take a good look at yourself and to do your own perspective of yourself. Forget about everybody else. And say, Lord, how about it? Me and you, can we have a conversation? Been a while. Usually when I come to you, I just say, Lord, I need this, I need this, I need this, I need this, and, and can you fix this and fix that and all that. But Lord, I want to talk to you about where I'm at tonight, where my heart is. I want to deal with you about some things that, that you've done. I, why didn't you kill the whole nation of Israel after they didn't turn? They said they would and they didn't. Oh, it's no good. Pity party. I wouldn't beat you up for it. I think his pity was well founded, don't you? Well, he shouldn't act that way. But he did. And if that's you tonight, however the preacher sees fit to close the service, maybe you might consider those things tonight. Heavenly Father, I pray as we get the beginning of a message, the beginning of a meeting, the beginning of a revival service, and you'll help us to look at the revival in Elijah's life and realize that but by the grace of God, we would be in the same predicament if not now, we have been. And Lord, we might pause just long enough here tonight to think about our own situation and allow you to come and comfort us as only you can. And we pray these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.